Okay, fine. We're doing the sample size test. We have 68 CPUs we're testing today because on January 25th, 16 minutes after it was posted, I screenshotted this comment on a CPU review. It says, not including multiple units of CPUs you are testing, all caps, is scientifically incorrect. Okay, Greg, thanks to, uh, to Greg here, we've changed the name. We spent over $10,000 on CPUs to test this point. Uh, we are testing again about 68 today. We have three batches of 20 different SKUs plus some extras mixed in. And we then spent months testing them. We started the testing and the purchasing, I think back in February, then in March, we got really into it. And we finally concluded in June. And that's without even getting to the fact that a product review based on a singular product is still a fair review because if they're shipping it to market, it's fair game. But we're, we'll talk about that aspect later. I was joined by a couple of special guests for that side of things. We still wanted to put this to the test though. And so today we're answering the question of whether sample size truly matters in the scope of a review for a CPU. Short answer, no. Long answer, a lot more interesting. Uh, plus, there's a specific instance where it might matter, and we'll talk to Roman about that. So for this video, we'll be briefly joined by Tim from Hardware Unboxed. Yeah, I've seen that comment a fair, a fair bit. You see this, like I'm sure you get the same, you see the same comments over and over and over again of just misconceptions in the way things are tested or, or done. And by Der Bauer from uh, Der Bauer. Jeder fragt, wer der Bauer ist. Jeder fragt, warum ist der Bauer. Aber niemand fragt, wie es der Bauer geht. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired, but that's that's basically it. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Because <Yeah. laughs> every reviewer has seen this comment probably hundreds or thousands of times over the years. It's a very interesting one. And we spoke with Hub for their shared passion of staring at benchmarks and watching them run. We actually have a Friday night watch party where we watch the GTA 5 benchmark cycle for about 95 minutes. It's very specific. Uh, and we spoke with Der Bauer because he happened to post his own sample size testing right when we were in the middle of running our first batch of CPUs, unbeknownst to us. We actually, originally we only had 20 CPUs and then you dropped your video and I was like, ah, f all right. All right. <laughs> so as soon as you dropped yours, I was like, all right, well, we need to, we need to bring something new to this conversation. So, so let's get 40 more. So after that, we went back to the drawing board. We bought even more CPUs uh, and we're bringing a ton of new data to the table here. We have millions of frames we're analyzing across those about 70 or so plus or minus CPUs, thousands of test passes, and tons of cool data that we can't even fit in today's video, but maybe we'll look into in the future. We're also trying to use this video as an educational opportunity to explain one more important aspect that's often overlooked here, which is the unit to unit perceived variance within CPUs, which is very small. I mean, Intel has a specific spec it tries to hit for frequency. Uh, AMD has got a little bit more baked in there because it has some plus or minus on the frequency, depending on things like temperature, silicon fitness, stuff like that. But it's a very small range. And so more likely the deviation will come in with the test platform itself. So this is almost more of a test of the testing than necessarily a test of CPU to CPU. We'll explore that today and spend a lot of time on it to really try and, uh, it was awesome. It was, this was a super cool opportunity despite the fact that on January 25th, that comment uh, took up space in my head, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting the rent back, I guess. It wasn't rent free, we're making this video. So it's actually negative rent, I spent a lot of money. <laughs> to help with understanding the difference though between the test approach and the CPU itself being different, we're gonna briefly be showing the audience how to identify these types of bad data situations in case you personally do any hobbyist testing. Oh, and we have a pretty cool announcement for this video too. So as part of this review, we obviously ended up buying a lot of CPUs that we will not need now that we're done with this. Uh, we need to get rid of them. So only until we run out of the CPUs, we're gonna have a special code on the store. And if you buy $220 worth of items on store.gamersnexus.net, and while we still have these CPUs, we will include a free CPU with your order. So you can use code free AMD for an R5-7600 or code free Intel for an i5-13600KF. That's, that's KF, there is no IGP. Uh, we don't have a ton of these. 
Not sure how many we'll make available. It, it, it'll be less than 40 in total. But while it's active there, the code will show up as a $1 discount in your cart. And that's how our warehouse team will know to include a CPU with your order. So if you see a $1 discount appear with the code in the cart, that means we still have the inventory, you'll get the CPU. If you see a red message pop up or you don't see the discount, the code's rejected, it means we've run out. Now, these will go super fast because it is, I mean, it is a good deal. We're just trying to recoup some of our base costs on the CPUs. These have all been tested in today's content and they're working, but they're shipped as is. You're buying the products on the store and the CPU is free. So we're not able to offer any technical support or warranties on the CPUs, but it's possible that the manufacturer's warranty transfers between owners. You can check AMD or Intel in your region for that. Ultimately, we don't make the CPUs. Just make sure the code applies if you really want one. I sincerely doubt that's going to last more than a day or two. So today we're looking for a few key things. First of all, we'll be using this test to test our testing. Uh, it should be consistent, and historically we have some good data to support that, but there's significant value here because we don't normally look at this many CPUs. Uh, separately, significant variance is more likely to point us towards the candidacy to eliminate a game from the benchmark suite like CSGO rather than necessarily a CPU difference. So uh, we're going to go game by game first. Now that means we are completely siloing and isolating the data. So we're looking at within this one game, what is the, the bottom to top performance sort of maximum improvement you can get the range of results. And uh, then at the end of it, we'll look at the uh, sort of ranked results in aggregate. Now this part is really important, so please pay attention to this. If CPU A is faster than CPU B in one game, that doesn't necessarily mean that CPU A is therefore better or faster than CPU B, period. So what we would need to see is a consistency where CPU A is always faster than CPU B, uh, or at least the vast majority of the time in a very clear way, because it's otherwise not a fair conclusion to say A is better than B. It might just be normal variance within that game. Because remember, there's a lot going on here. There's software and there's hardware at play. A couple other quick notes. This data is not comparable to our other data necessarily because uh, we use different drivers. We tested it with a different OS that we built specifically for this. Uh, and we're using locked game versions, except for Rainbow Six, which we'll talk about. Uh, that It was locked for the data we're showing, but we have some notes on that. And so it's not comparable to the other stuff. Now, the reason we're starting with Rainbow Six first, well, was a couple of them. It has the most sort of potential for problems with testing. And we'll show you a couple of very clear examples of that. Additionally, uh, it is relatively variable as far as games go for performance run to run. So there's more deviation baked in there. So we're already covering that aspect uh, from more of a testing methodology and educational standpoint, gives you some insight to what we do. And then we'll move forward with the rest of the games in a much faster fashion. So Rainbow Six is to lay the foundation here. Time to drill into the data per model. We'll start with Rainbow Six Siege, which is actually the most variable out of all the gaming tests we're looking at today. So we're starting on the one with the widest swings, and that's at a game level, not a CPU level. And we're also starting with a 13600K. For the 13600K, we had 20 CPUs in this test. We had 80 total used test passes, which combined had over 3.2 million frames of data from which we can derive our average frame times, 1% lows, 0.1% lows and FPS eventually. Here's the chart with every 13600K's result in Rainbow Six Siege. Our range, or max minus min average FPS result, was 11.1. .1. The review sample was actually right in the middle at 684 FPS average. Our lowest to highest result at 676.9 versus 688 produced a 1.64% increase. So our findings here indicate effectively no impact from one CPU to the next. And again, we're not even at a stage where we can determine if the differences are from the CPUs. A 1% error is already fairly standard just as a general safety net for other system level excursions and background noise like unexpected system processes or Windows background tasks. One more really important note here too, we're gonna use some standard deviation charts in this video and we wanna make sure it's very clear what these are used for and why we use them. So uh, we use these as a tool to indicate to us the run-to-run -run variants of a CPU, but the standard deviation charts you're going to see, they are not a quality indicator for the CPU itself, and they're not really necessarily a quality indicator for the game. So what we actually use them for is to serve as a giant red flag for us to rapidly identify any potentially bad passes in a test run for a game. So 
this isn't data we usually publish, and it can't be compared between games. It's Again, it's no indicator of the CPU's quality. Uh, it is strictly a tool for us to look at quickly and say, oh, this one's got a 20 where everything else is a 1. Probably we need to look into this. So that's why these are here, and we're going to present them to you so you can get some insight for uh, how we might rapidly identify issues and test passes because they don't always complete perfectly and that's kind of that's most of what the job is is figuring that part out as you can see on average we observed an 8.5 fps average fps standard deviation and 4.7 fps for one percent lows it's normal to have run-to-run -run variation this can happen for a number of non-hardware reasons it's important that everyone understands that these do not necessarily indicate the quality of the cpu in any way but rather the consistency of the test itself that particular time. But more commonly, this data is what we use to rapidly identify if a test just needs to be rerun due to a software or OS anomaly. Now, this particular standard deviation chart would trigger our attention in testing to inspect uh, the CPU 00413's tests more closely. So we did that and we found a bad pass. Let's look at what that means. We have a new standard deviation chart for you. It looks like this. Now we get to build the story of how we process data for a review. This gives you some insight. We're going to remove the first pass for every entry in the Rainbow Six Siege data set, and then we can append more if we need to. Sometimes we find that a game has unpredictable behavior when it first launches and executes an initial pass. And that's true of both manual and automated testing. It's just a game-to-game -game behavior. These numbers are fairly different overall. Of all these passes, the average standard deviation is about 3.8 FPS, down from 8.5 in the data set with the first pass. 1% is down from 4.7 to 2.6. That's pretty good considering that the frame rate itself is so damn high. So this shows you that benchmarking isn't a perfect science, and that's why it requires so much attention to detail and so many controls, because ultimately you're still sort of at the behest of the game. Now we have some methods to deal with this. It's mostly by inspecting the data, rerunning things as needed, or running additional passes, say maybe we do 8 or 12. Specifically, we use those if it's clear to us that the unpredictable behavior is a software or a test problem, not a hardware problem, because we're reviewing the hardware. But in this instance, that first pass of data wasn't CPU behavior. You can think of it as almost purely random. It's external. Back to our first chart. Here's the data with that first pass filtered out for all CPUs. We now have a range of 10.2 FPS for average, with 1% lows very consistent between all CPUs here. The improvement from lowest CPU in the list to highest is 1.5%. Even with that filtering, we're only down a tenth of a percent in difference. So the sort of mini conclusion just for this section of the topic is that with this test, there's effectively no difference in these Intel CPUs. We would not be concerned about pulling any random CPU off a retail shelf for this test. That's still valid, of course, because it's a retail unit, they sold it. But based on our data here, it supports that the data range is close enough CPU to CPU as to be representative of the intended performance. And as you saw here, what mattered more was actually the ability to filter a potentially bad test result, but not the hardware necessarily itself. Let's move on to AMD. For the 7600, we had 21 CPUs that we used. Now that we've explained some basics for test filtering and sort of data tracking methodology, we'll move toward keeping all the bad data on this chart to help teach a few points at once. The main point is that software often plays a far more relevant role than hardware, and testing methods play an even larger role than that. Here's the chart with every result. CPU 20003 is the review sample that we used. And that would have been one of the first CPUs off the line, so there's some process maturity to consider. We'll first highlight, though, every result that starts with the word bad. This is a good teaching moment for the audience to see what we really do when we test things. But it's deeper than this, too. Even the data that isn't marked bad has some bad passes in it. So this chart is not the final one for this. We'll work our way there. First, the stack of four tests on the bottom were run in a different month than the first set. These two data sets were tested with different game versions. As such, those four CPUs are comparable, sort of, to each other, establishing a range of about 8 FPS out of over 600, but not against the rest of the data. Look at one above those, though. We have one that was labeled bad mount. These are pretty rare, but it's an instance where we ran the test and we looked at the data and we saw a greater deviation than the rest of the data set indicated should be likely. So we ran through the usual checklists, ensured that it wasn't a CPU level issue because we'd want to keep that if so, and we found that ultimately the operator did have a bad mount on the CPU. Typically, this is data we'd just throw out and rerun and we'd never show it because it's not the CPU's fault. 
Here, though, it serves its purpose educationally. And this is a part of the discussion that's never really captured when people leave comments saying, there's not enough sample size. They might not realize that the testing itself is far more likely to produce variables that are greater than CPU to CPU. Let's get a version of this chart without the bad data. Our new data range is 33.4 FPS average, or a sort of lowest to highest improvement of 4.6%. This chart still has some bad passes in it though, so we're not at the final yet. Here's a look at the average standard deviation for all passes. In a normal review process, we'd use this data to point towards anything that looks suspicious or out of line. The 19.9 FPS average deviation is clearly problematic, and we'd inspect the 20189 result, the 20003 result, uh, 20515 result more closely in a review process, and maybe 20499 also. Okay, let's see what we find. So for 20522, the average results from the CPU with the 19.9 average deviation shows us that we have one result at 713 FPS, while the rest are at 750 or so. That, to us, looks problematic. Under normal review conditions, we'd typically rerun this through for four more passes, at least one more time, so we might end up with eight passes or more, depending on how variable it is, and then we'd look at that data set, and then maybe again. You don't want to throw away real data just because it looks off. So ideally, we try to explain it or determine for fact if it's system level noise or an issue uh, or if it's related to the CPU itself. In this case, we determined it was simply a bad pass due to unexpected game behavior. These happen sometimes, and uh, a couple when you run 84 passes is actually not that bad. But they're easily rectified by rerunning it through more times. Let's go through and filter out all of the bad passes unrelated to the CPUs, rerun if necessary, and leave only the final chart for the hardware comparison. And this one is what we get after we went through and eliminated validated bad passes that were clearly due to external factors. There's a lot of rerunning and double checking for some games more than others in a review process. For transparency here, we eliminated only four bad passes across all of these CPUs. And remember, each one's at least four base passes, so there weren't many changes. And also, those four were spread across a few devices. The new top to bottom is 26.4 FPS, or a 3.63% difference. It's basically system noise at this point. That's a much larger range than we'll see in the rest of this testing today, so we need some more. Some of this is, of course, normal run to run variance, but AMD's clock speed is also different from Intel's. Intel's is simple, it's just kind of a number. AMD's CPUs, though, have a silicon quality, and likewise, the solder TIM quality could affect the temperature, which could affect the boosting. But uh, it doesn't really matter if the percentage difference is small enough, so we'll come back to that. We're going to pick up the pace on on this, we could keep walking you through the whole process, but going forward, we're just going to present the finals, and that's because we don't really need to filter any of the other ones. Rainbow Six is kind of a special case, but it was a good educational example. For the rest of these, we don't have the problem where game updates affected CPU, so we'll have actually four more data points in all the charts, and uh, you'll also start to see why we choose the games we do for testing. It's reliability and consistency. We're moving to GTA 5, let's carry on with the 7600, and then we'll go back to Intel. In GTA 5, which is one of the most consistent games we've ever tested, we found a total of four passes that required retest or deletion out of 84 shown. That's good. We have two CPUs with the other driver. Their results were again within range, but as they're not perfectly comparable, we removed them. The range is 2.18% improvement from lowest to highest. The top five results are nearly completely identical. That's some insane consistency. A 2% range seems like a fair mix of system noise with a small amount of frequency deviation between CPUs, especially AMD. We wouldn't expect more than that chip to chip anyway. Let's look at standard deviation. Overall, it's pretty damn good. This is technically higher average FPS standard deviation than we see on Intel, but that's relative. We still have seven CPUs with a standard deviation within a range of 0.8 to 1.2. The 1% lows are naturally higher due to less data to average, so all this is within acceptable range for us. Let's go to Intel's 13600K. No full passes were deleted here. We didn't have any problems with them uh, overall. So we'll start with standard deviation this time. Here, our run-to-run -run average FPS standard deviation, averaged, is about 0.9 FPS. That's exciting just to us on the testing team, because that means this test is, at least today, consistent enough to be strongly representative of just the CPUs. And here's the data. We're looking at a 1.8% improvement from bottom to top here, so a somewhat standard plus or minus 1% system level noise would account for any possible hardware differences in a review. And that's assuming there even is one. Remember that we still need to compare each of these CPUs at the very end to see if the bottom ones are consistently there, 
Because if they're not, if they just kind of shuffle around, then it's all just noise. Let's stick with the 13600K for a second and look at Tomb Raider next. We'll start with standard deviation. No passes here were deleted, all appeared within usual range. In this data set, we have an overall consistent average FPS. 1% lows are more variable, typically around 2 FPS or so, but we have one excursion to 3.9. That's still not bad, and it's accounted for in our reviews process when we tell you what is or isn't meaningful. This kind of comes up when we use phrasing like functionally identical or not meaningfully different. It helps illustrate some game noise anyway, which is inescapable. Here's the average FPS chart. Our top to bottom range is 4.9 FPS average, and remember that those bottom two CPUs had a standard deviation of 2.2 and 3.7, so they were noisier than many of the other results. Regardless, we're not filtering that out because it's reasonable. We're seeing a 1.89% bottom to top range, so that's with the raw data we got from this. We're back to the AMD R570-600 for Tomb Raider, and that's consistent. The 257.2 to 264.9 result produces a 2.99% increase. Still higher than the gap we saw for Intel top to bottom, but given the difference in clock behavior on AMD specifically, it's expected. They don't have the same designs. And again, that's why you typically hear us say things like functionally the same or slightly different, just to set the expectations for what we think is significant versus what might not really matter, especially once you get down to a human level. Now we're on to Final Fantasy XIV on the 13600K and KF. We only filtered two noisy average FPS entries out of 88 total. And remember, we're looking at an average of multiple averages that are averaging uh, thousands upon thousands of frame time entries. So, and also remember that filtering here doesn't mean the entire CPU's data was removed, but literally the average of one single pass across two different CPUs. In these results, we have a range of 5.4 FPS bottom to top with a maximum improvement of uh, lowest to highest yielding 2.1%. This is actually really exciting to us once again because we're starting to establish a trend that starts to give us a better idea of how to account for the true range of a product. It's something we kind of guessed at before, but now we have data for it and we'll be able to reference this long term for reviews. The standard deviation was pretty good here as well, but we won't dwell on it. We've seen similar charts a lot now. Moving on to Final Fantasy with the 7600, here we're seeing a bottom to top range of 5.7 FPS average or 203 to 208.7 a 2.8% maximum improvement, lowest to highest, so we're within the same range we've seen for the CPU previously. It's remarkably consistent. Take a look at the standard deviation though. Most of our results are around or under 1 FPS run to run here. It's crazy. We're really happy with that. We're next looking at Stellaris for the simulation time. Lower is better. This is in processing time rather than FPS. So for this, we only needed to filter out a single result out of all of them, as that single result was suspect for background noise. Here the improvement from 29.5 seconds to 29.1 is 1.36% time reduced. Technically, this math is going the opposite direction to the prior math, but remember that a reduction is what we want here, and besides, calculating it the other direction or a percent slowdown would be 1.37%, so it's irrelevant with these numbers. The consistency is remarkable in this game. We're happy that our viewers recommended it for the CPU test bench, so thank you for continually asking us to add this one because it looks great so far. Standard deviation is pretty crazy too, though. Here's the same game for the R5 7600. The maximum improvement, lowest to highest, is 2.3% time reduced, or a range of 0.8 seconds. The average result was 33.8 seconds against all of these. Now for Far Cry 6. This is another insanely consistent one, and it's exactly why we include it in our test. Our approach and methodology is that we want the most reliable results for us, for our testing. So sometimes that means we keep older games around longer. We hope that sharing this helps you understand why we do. It's not to say it's the only approach, it's just to explain why it's ours. The worst to best range is 2.5 FPS average, and that's before filtering results for a test condition that we'll explain in a moment. The range here is a 1.36% improvement from lowest to highest on the 13600Ks. Now we get to another great learning experience for the audience. This is the standard deviation for that first round of Far Cry 6. Overall, we're averaging a 7 FPS deviation in our primary metric. That sounds high compared to some of the others, but we've learned over the years that it's an extremely consistent result for Far Cry. The first pass is always at least a couple FPS higher than the remaining three passes, and you already saw the prior chart where we still ended up with a great 1.36% range bottom to top. Let's just remove the first pass anyway though, just for the lesson it gives us. Suddenly we're down to about a 3 FPS average for the other three passes, for standard deviation that is. The first pass runs high, but it's consistently high. 
So it's still useful data. In other words, it's not random. It's not spurious. It's a real game behavior. It's predictable, and it happens basically every time in the same way. So it's valid. But just in case, here's the data without the first pass. The range is the same. It's 1.39% bottom to top. The absolute number is, of course, different, but methodologically, the choice of keeping or cutting the first pass in this particular title for the way we test is irrelevant. Still, it's good insight for you all as to how people doing reviews have to make decisions like this, and it shows why one outlet might make a decision that doesn't align with another. This is just a choice of what makes the tester feel the most comfortable with their data, or if they think it's more accurate one way or the other. Here's the AMD result. The bottom of the top is 2.89%. It's similar to our other AMD results, and it's again overall consistent. Based on our data, which specific unit of a model you get is entirely irrelevant for these modern CPUs. It matter more for overclocking, but for stock, we're just not seeing real differences. Let's move on. CSGO is up now for the 13600K. This game feels similar to Far Cry. The first pass is significantly different for performance, yet consistent overall. This result is without the first pass included. The difference here is a 1.79% bottom-to-top improvement potential between tests, and the unfiltered result is about the same percentage. The standard deviation's pretty wild, though. This is with the first pass included. Now, this is where standard deviation itself is somewhat misleading, as basically all statistical calculations can be, unfortunately. It's still helpful, though, if used properly. The actual run-to-run -run variance is much smaller than this. It's just that the first pass is different from the others. It's not inherently uh, individually variable, it's just different from the next three in a large way, similar to Far Cry. So the deviation, flawed or not for this one, calculates to an average of, say, 40 FPS or so for each run. You're seeing that averaged against the lower values here as well. And here it is with that first pass removed. Now we have a high consistency run to run. So once again, re-emphasizing the first pass runs high for this one. But it didn't really change the differences that much. Finally, CSGO on the 7600. This is where we get some variance. CSGO is a massive pain in the ass to test in general. It's tough to test for GPUs. It's got all kinds of bugs over the years. And it's tough to test for CPUs. The AMD CPU shows a 6.4% bottom-to-top improvement filter, or something like 7% unfiltered for data that's obviously bad. Now, this is one result. We've produced an entire video before this at this point that contradicts this one for data. And so we think this is probably not a CPU difference, but rather a difference with the way the game interacts with the platform. That could be the CPU, but it could also be something like the GPU driver via the CPU, where... There may be a driver overhead issue that's less predictable. It could be any number of things. At the end of the day, though, we don't think this is representative of the CPU differences on a hardware level just because it's so different from the rest of the results we've seen. Now for one last set of tests. This is with Cinebench R23, which we're running multiple times as well. This is a full all-core workload that's much heavier than games, so for AMD especially, it should be more likely to draw out any major differences from even normal clock deviations. Here, we observed a 3.4% maximum improvement from bottom to top for AMD. Roman previously ran a similar test for his samples of R5 7600s and found a top to bottom of 6.3%. It's not too crazy of a difference from ours when considering they're two entirely different testing approaches and operators. And for AMD, a methodological difference for how close together the passes are conducted could affect this. His lowest result to us looks like maybe a mix of Cinebench's existing variant plus the CPU frequency deficit. But even if we account for that one result, he'd still be seeing a 4.99% difference. In either case, though, we're both seeing higher differences in an all-core torture load like Cinebench than in heavy gaming loads. It makes sense. And we also both came to the conclusion that all of these CPUs are well running within spec and all of what you saw is totally expected. So an extra couple percentage points given the test differences isn't abnormal, particularly for Cinebench. With just the 13600K and the 7600 CPUs explained so far, not even getting into our other CPUs, it's time to look at the consistency of the rankings. If the same CPUs are consistently at the top or bottom of the charts, that'd be maybe useful information, especially if it's, say, always rank number one or always rank number 22. If they're randomly scattered, then it's more likely system noise, or at least we would lack the confidence to start making a determination as to which one is best. Here's the table for the 13600K. All we looked for here was the pattern to jump out. The noticeable one is that the CPU 00761 only has single digit ranks with lower being better. 
It's not always rank one. That'd be very easy if so, uh, but it tends to be higher. CPU 00643 did okay as well. It has three lower ranked games though, and those indicate its first four single ranked results might not actually really mean anything. It could just be chance. CPU 03078 had only double digit ranks, so it is typically lower, and none of this is helping, so let's look at something else. Here's another weird visualization. We're getting to a better one, so hang on. Uh, for this, each dot is a rank for a game. We basically glanced at this to try and get a quick gut feeling. CPU 04539, for example, stacked vertically, is clearly generally worse rank. CPU 00761 is clearly generally better ranked. We tried bubble graph versions of this as well. We won't bother showing them uh, because none of it really answers anything for us, at least not confidently. Well, let's do a simple unweighted average. This is only looking at the rank per game as a whole number and then averaging all of those ranks together. It is extremely barbaric uh, and, and not necessarily conclusive, but again, it helps guide us a direction. We'll get to that. We have a conclusion. We'll get there. But here, CPU 00761 is clearly averaging a better rank per game and actually in a large way than the rest of these. CPU 00829 is clearly averaging worse. And again, in a large way, there's a big gap there. That means there's more 20s and high teens in its rank. There are problems with this chart, we'll get there, but let's look at one more first. Here are the raw numbers for that 7600 by rank. That's, again, not helpful for the same reasons we're about to discuss and that we already did, but at least you get a glance. And here's the average chart. Technically, yes, some trends emerge. Notably, 20189 and 20514 managed to be far apart. But that means nothing in a world where results are a couple percentage points different at best, or at most, even if it is a real hardware level difference. But we do have more CPUs. We won't spend all the same time going over our other CPUs in the same level of detail. You probably get the point. But we ran the same suite for a batch of AMD Ryzen 3 4100 CPUs. We had 20 of these as well. So uh, we're 60 plus CPUs now in testing. If you're wondering why this specific one, uh, it was just because this particular batch was sent to us by AMD's lab team. They didn't need it anymore. They wanted us to bring it over to Patrick Stone for his local computer engineering high school classroom. And we quickly ran them through variance tests first. We were just making sure they worked. It's useful though, because it's a totally different architecture and it's very low end. And, and yes, he did get the CPUs for his classroom build. We won't get into the details here in full, but it had the lowest standard deviation run to run per CPU of all of these. We also had four Intel i7-8086Ks around the office. We decided to just run those through also. Here's the summary table, maybe again. The 4100 tested against 20 CPUs and every test in this chart ranged from 1.7% to 2.5% when calculating the lowest to highest result range per game. The simple average of all these percentages is an average uplift of 2.02% chart to chart, but not necessarily from one fixed CPU to another fixed CPU. Again, it's isolated per game. The 8086K, which had a low sample size, so that one's not necessarily representative, but why not, plotted 0.5% to 2.8% range. The 13600K, once again, was about 1.4% to 2.1% against 22 samples. The 7600 ranged 3.63%, ignoring the CSGO result, because we think there's a, a driver or other external reason there that we already explained. And we had about 22 to 23 samples for the 7600, depending on what we were using for the tests. And in most cases, we averaged about 20 of these for the results. Two of them were on other drivers. They're within the same range as you saw earlier. And then the last one was sometimes removed. Rainbow Six had less data to work with due to the game updates we talked about earlier. All totaled game to game across about 68 samples, depending on how you count the ones that were dropped in Rainbow Six sometimes, we're seeing about a 2% range. Uh, so we have confidence in the approximate 2% or so plus or minus a bit as differences that we saw earlier, one game to the next. That much we're excited about. It, it sort of helps us genuinely to bake in an expectation for, all right, so let's just pretend there is a worse or a better CPU than what we got. What realistically is the maximum range for that? It's looking like about 2% in these gaming scenarios. Now, this video is about the topic of, is a single sample enough for a review? And we've answered that. But overclocking in the Silicon Lottery is a thing. It's proven. I, there was a whole business built on the back of the Silicon Lottery. So that much we know is a meaningful variance. And for that, let's check in with Roman. 
So what's your experience, Ben, with go overclocking differences chip to chip? I think my best impression I have on this is back when I was spinning 6700Ks at Case King because I did all of them myself manually. And I binned about 4,000 CPUs Jesus. in about three months. Let's say uh, water cooling. The difference ranges from about 400 to 500 megahertz difference in, in like peak what's possible. But from what I can see now, like um, over the over the years, they definitely improved the CPU quality overall. Their their quality control in the in the in the fabs. So overall, it seemed like with the latest gens, like 12th and 13th gen, the the difference became much smaller. Back then with the 6700K, we saw differences in voltages from about um, 200 millivolts difference from like best to worst samples. And like also in like thermally, there was also huge differences. Some CPUs would run maybe, let's say, 90 degrees Celsius peak and the other one would just uh, run at 60 degrees Celsius peak. Oh, wow. um, but at the same time, we were also checking for leakage. And we next asked Roman about a topic we didn't cover here today. We focused on the gaming charts mostly, but the topic we brought up was power. We specifically wanted to know about the 7600s. I was visiting Hetzner, and they they are running um, uh, those CPUs in in servers. Okay. And so they so they bought also thousands of those CPUs, huh. and um, they had a huge tolerance in in the CPUs, and which they discovered like. Um, uh, they had an initial initial batch of I don't know a thousand units, uh, used them, evaluated thermals and everything, and then after uh, a couple of reorders, they suddenly had CPUs that I don't know consumed fifteen to twenty watt more yeah. with exactly the same uh, settings, and it seemed like AMD was using um, the low end CPUs as basically a garbage bin or like I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to say it, but like <laughs> you know yeah. to just rep repurpose the really bad ones. Um, because they can still obviously run the, the specification, but just in a different level. Even though some of them were much worse than the others, um, they would still um, run the, the advertised clock speeds. So right. they could all run the, the boost in, in gaming. Games perform better because it are, um, it's easier for the CPU to maintain the higher clock because the load is so much lower. Roman later noted that he saw about a 2 to 3% difference in clocks for gaming scenarios, which actually aligns really well with the data that we collected. So that's two different sources landing on a similar conclusion on the gaming side. And as far as reviews, even if you look at, say, our Cinebench numbers where it's a 3 to 4% range, answering the question of, is one sample enough for reviews, uh, we think yes, one sample is enough. Now, of course, out of millions of CPUs shipped, there's a possibility that one has some super crazy result, really good or really bad. And if a reviewer happens to land on one, it's still reflecting the reality of that chip. As reviewers, does it matter if, if we have CPU A or B? And the answer is no. Not realistically. I've got some thoughts on that, and so does Tim from Hardware Unboxed. We'll join him later. So what we don't have confidence in is declaring a singular victor or loser across all of the charts. We can look at it siloed, but once you start looking in aggregate, all of them, we just don't have the data there. It's not just a matter of sample size. We'd have to run all these tests more times, uh, including with re-sockets and things like that, uh, allowing sub-timings that aren't surfaced to recalculate, things of that nature. In other words, it's possible that there are other variables, even with all these controls, that could reshuffle the stack by, say, 0.2, 0.5%, and now the best is just actually the top of the average. But none of that matters. What we care about is that these are close enough that actually it's irrelevant for a review out of all these CPUs to embark on another few hundred hours of testing to maybe confirm that, yes, one CPU is in fact consistently 2% better than another is pointless. We'd still have uncertainty at the end of it. There's always a natural variance. Maybe we make a declaration of a 1% victory, but we already know there's CPU variance sample to sample. That's fact. So that doesn't do anything. What we care about is how much. And the answer we got is for the types of reviews we do, it doesn't appear to be much with these. And now we get back to the topic I mentioned earlier, where if there is a variance that's more meaningful, let's say 5%, uh, it's still a legitimate review because you're still capturing a real product in situ and presenting how it performs. Uh, so whatever the case is, you know, yes, it may help to test another one, but 
that's why there's a lot of reviews from a lot of people. So talking with Tim from Hardware Unboxed about this, here's what he had to say. Anything you want to say for people who are, oh, it's just, it's sample size. Ah, uh, yeah. I've seen that comment a fair, a fair bit, especially, um, I mean, with monitors, everyone tests monitors differently. So, you know, a lot of the times you get the, oh, oh they've got that number and we've got this number and they're different. So... You know, did you get a, a bad sample or did they get a really good sample or who's sending out the best products to you? And I mean, my general thoughts are it's kind of like they're selling these products and some variance is going to occur, but generally speaking, you know, it's not going to be too much. And again, if we get a really bad sample in that's say slightly below the expected variance, they're selling it. So I think it's fair to test a product like that. Um, so yeah, I certainly don't, don't necessarily agree with the like, oh, you've only tested one. How could you possibly know if this is, is good or bad? I think if, yeah, you know, the manufacturer has got to be happy with what they're putting out. If we just happen to get a product that's not as good or whatever then. But those comments are certainly very frustrating and maybe don't have a lot of insight into sort of the different ways that, that people can test. Tim also reminded us that actually about five years ago, Hard Run Box ran a similar test with, I think it was about 10 samples that were acquired for retail from a previous Intel generation. There's that video as well that we've made that sort of got our, at least when we tested that, our results, which were again, sound pretty similar to what you'd described, just having a look over it, but I loved that video five years ago. So oh, it's yeah. hard to remember. Yeah. yeah, I mean, our general process for reviews would be that anything outside of sort of 5% one way or another is, you know, a significant difference. And then inside that we've, you know, if it's testing two different products, we tend to call that a tie. That tends to make us think, oh, you know, how much variant should we be looking for? We probably want to make sure that if we're calling two products, you know, one's much faster and you should buy it, that it's outside that sort of tolerance. But, but I mean, just from my perspective, generally plus minus five percent sounds like a big margin but you know there's so many different things that can happen in testing that often if there's a, a different configuration or something that you've made a huge error with that it will show up as a fairly substantial difference so yeah that's sort of that's sort of where where we'd see it and we'd agree with those points so even if there is a wide variance in a particular unit as long as it's truly a unit level issue not just the testing process uh, the company still ships it to a customer, the review still shows that possibility, and that's important. So philosophically, we kind of view it like if we buy a pre-built from a company and it comes with a fan backwards that causes the CPU to hit 100 degrees, a thing that happened. That to us is still a valid review because it's still a thing that would have happened to a customer. They built it that way, and if it weren't us, it would have been someone else. So that's valid. Now, it's CPUs, uh, it's a little easier to identify when there's a problem because they are so tight in tolerances. These companies, they've kind of perfected it for the most part. So most of the bad stuff gets tossed. The original comments we read to kick this piece off attacked the idea of sort of the credibility, the validity of any reviews, because they're all based on a single sample. Maybe you get one with two or something if you're lucky, but it would dismiss the value of any and all reviews really that anyone can afford to do especially, uh, just to try and hit some technically by the books approach to sample size with testing. And you, you do have to balance the reality with it. Is it. Do you want no reviews or do you want uh, reviews you can cross compare with people and probably based on our data are within 2% anyway. And if it's more than that, we'll know. Now that doesn't mean that reviewer differences should be within 2%. It means that unit to unit, if the same person tests it the same way, they might see that percentage. A couple interesting things we learned. So this was from an off record source at one of the two big CPU manufacturers. Can't say specifically which one. Uh, they tend to shoot for around a 3% variance maximally in a retail unit and the CPU test lab we've, we spoke with anonymously at one of these two companies considers a 1% system noise to be baked into all the tests, just to give you an idea for the sort of accepted background. The best approach, we think, is uh, in agreeing with Tim from Hardware Unboxed here, is to just use the right language in the review where if two numbers are really close, we try to remember to say things like these are functionally equal. You've probably heard us say that a lot. These are effectively the same. They're basically the same. Uh, you might start describing differences like 5% as technically ahead or a little bit ahead, things like that to try and temper the expectation of how much that really matters. But this test was a ton of fun to analyze. We've talked enough about it. Uh, we have significantly more data as well. I don't know if there's enough interest. I think we technically have thermals. Maybe I have to check. 
Uh, pretty sure we've got frequency for everything. We've probably got some hardware info power numbers, but nothing uh, more direct than that. And um, for now, the gaming differences are there, and that should address the performance side. And Roman has some pretty good points on the power side, which we didn't tackle today. We have enough with the gaming benchmark. So, and of course, he also talked about overclocking, which is a totally different beast. There is variability there that is relevant. Different topic. Though. All right. Thanks for watching. You can support us on store.gamersnexus.net or on patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly so that we can keep doing stuff like this. We actually had just bought a bunch of another thing, uh, but I'm not going to say what it is yet because we're doing a, a sample size test of that thing too. So thanks for watching. See you all next time.